I grew up in church, and uh, so it's not surprising that I came to uh, faith in Christ at a very early age. Someone shared John 3.16 with me, and uh, I realized I need a Savior. I asked the Lord to forgive me of my sins, and I uh, prayed and accepted Christ as my Savior and was baptized. Later on, the Lord led me into a Bible college and to full-time vocational Christian ministry. I served uh, about 45 years in church ministry, wearing a lot of different hats. But ultimately, it's not about serving in a church, it's about serving the Lord. And so I'm excited as I move into my retirement years to serve just in different ways. I would encourage you because I have come to realize that you can know for sure that you're saved and God will use you and that His Word is true. Well, good morning. If you have your Bibles, join me in 1 John uh, chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2 is where we're going to um, begin, and then we're going to uh, be in the first three verses of uh, 1 John chapter 3. So the end of 1 John chapter 2, beginning of 1 John chapter 3 is where we're going to be this morning. Um, I'm going to start reading uh, where we left off last week. I want to start in actually verse 27, um, and then we'll pick up in verse 28 is what will be on the screen. So verse 27, 1 John chapter 2 says this, But the anointing that you received from him abides in you. Okay, I'm going to read that again. But the anointing that you receive from him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about everything and is true and is no lie, just as it has taught you, abide in him. Now verse 28. And now little children, abide in him, so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is, and everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure." Pray with me. Jesus, thank you so much for this morning. God, thank you for the privilege it is to be able to gather as a church family. God, I pray that now as we turn our attention to your word, would you give us eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts to believe what it is that you want to say to us through your word this morning. We love you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so here is where we are going this morning. This is the, the main idea. Abiding in the Lord can truly give you assurance and confidence for today and hope for tomorrow. Okay, I'll say it again. Abiding in the Lord can truly give you assurance and confidence for today and hope for tomorrow. Um, so before we move uh, any further this morning, before we go anywhere, there's a truth that we need to that we need to keep at the forefront of our minds as we read this passage of scripture this morning. And the truth is this, is that Jesus is coming back. And that is good news. Amen. Jesus is coming back. See, already Jesus has come. Uh, he was born uh, as a baby. He was fully God. He was fully man. He lived a sinless life. Uh, he went to the cross where he bore the weight of our sin uh, and the punishment that we deserve because of our sin. And he died uh, and he uh, rose and uh, he ascended into heaven. And as he was ascending into heaven, he gave us the promise that he is going to come back. And so Jesus is going to come back. The king is going to return. The question from the text that is relevant to us this morning is that when you see Jesus face to face, how are you going to respond? In confidence or will you shrink back in shame? We know it's certain that Jesus is going to return, 
But what's not certain is whether or not we will be here or, we, or if we'll be with him in heaven. But what is certain is we will see him face to face. And so will you have confidence or will you shrink back in, in shame? And so I am not talking here about having uh, the confidence and righteousness in our own power to stand before the Lord in a confident way, like in our own strength and in our own ability to stand before the Lord and say, look what I've done. That's not what I'm talking about, okay? Um, the first part of the text is not a matter of salvation. The, the end of 1 John chapter 2 is not a matter of salvation. That comes in chapter 3, verse 1, Okay? So that is where, where that comes. So these first two verses deal with the Christian's um, affections for Christ and how those play out in the day to day and how that can give us hope for today uh, or uh, confidence for today and hope for tomorrow. And so what this does is it creates a little bit of a tension for us this morning. The tension that I believe that many of us um, wrestle with is that we don't deal with our sin very well. Okay, and now... Let me just explain where we're going. You may be thinking to yourself, hey, we just read that passage of scripture and it doesn't talk about, it doesn't talk about sin in, in there, right? But if you go, context is king. And if you go to verse four, it says, everyone who makes a practice of sinning, of uh, chapter three, everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins and in him there is no sin. Right? And so this is, where, this is where he's going. And so what we're doing this morning is we're kind of getting us ready for where we're going in the rest of, of 1 John chapter three, okay? And so the tension, one of the tensions here is, is that we don't actually deal with our sin very well. Instead, we think that we can hide it. We think that we can hide it from God and we think that we can hide it from, uh, from other people, those of us around us. And so look at this, this is really important. Instead, this is, this is the posture of, of many, uh, unfortunately, of many Christians. Instead of pursuing holiness and righteousness and doing the things that we know we ought to do that are commanded of us to do, to, to be done in the Bible, instead of doing those things, we just want to do what we want to do. And we want to do what makes us happy and what makes us comfortable. And, and oftentimes that is going against what we know God's word has called us to, to do. And we just pretend like the Lord doesn't see us. We just pretend like those around us don't, don't see us. And so we may say to ourselves, well, well, the Lord still loves me. And that's true. He does still love you. <laughs> and no, nothing can change that. And, uh, you, or you may think, I, I, can, I can't out sin God. And that's true, you can't out God. But again, these, this, these first couple of verses are not a matter of salvation. It's a matter of, of how your relationship with the Lord plays out in your life in the day to day, okay? And so when it comes to our sin, we think that we can hide from God. We think that we can hide from God, or maybe we think that we can hide, if you're a student in the room, you think you can hide from your parents. You think that you can hide from your spouse. You think that you can hide from your kids. Hide from our questions, hide from the consequences of sin, hide from our shame, hide from others, hide from reality. We think that we can hide. And to that, I simply remind you, Luke chapter 12, two through three says this, nothing is covered up that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. Therefore, whatever you said in the dark will be heard in the light. And what you have whispered in private rooms shall be proclaimed on the housetops. And so you're not hiding from God. <laughs> if you think you are, I just want to lovingly remind you of this gospel truth. If you are his, he will receive you every time. If you are his, he will receive you every time. It's a promise of scripture that we can count on. And so what happens whenever we try to hide is really we're just robbing ourselves of experiencing the gospel. And we're robbing the community of being able to experience gospel culture whenever we, whenever we try to hide. And so you, you may think that you're okay and yet you're anxious or you're lonely or depressed or sad or secretive. You won't show anybody your phone, you're full of shame, you're full of guilt. 
Look, J.C. Ryle says this, I lay it down fully and broadly as God's truth that a true Christian, a converted man, may reach such a comfortable degree of faith in Christ that in general he shall feel entirely confident as to the pardon and safety of his soul, shall seldom be troubled with doubts, seldom be distracted with fears, seldom be distressed by anxious questionings, and in short, the vexed by many an inward conflict with sin shall look forward to death without trembling and to judgment without dismay. This, I say, is the doctrine of the Bible. So this is where we're going this morning. So from the outset, I want to remind you, uh, just to kind of set the stage, uh, of the story of the prodigal son in Luke. You have, you have the story of the prodigal son, and so if you're not familiar with the story, let me just remind you. So you have this, you have this son who asks the father for his inheritance, and he asks it early. And so the father gives him his inheritance, and he goes off, and he squanders it in reckless living. Like, he lives this life of sin, and he squanders his inheritance. He loses everything, and uh, he's in a, a, a hard place. He's in a desperate place. And so he decides that he's going to go back to the father, right? And so this is what repentance looks like in our life. It's like we're going in one direction and we're living a life that is in sin, whether other people know it or they don't know it. The reality is, is we're living a life in sin and we're going one way. And repentance is putting our foot down and going back to the Father. I'm gonna return back to the Father. And typically, whenever we're returning back to the Father, we're thinking to ourselves, what have I done? What is my, what is my Father gonna say? I've, I've really messed up this time. And we begin to feel shame and guilt. But the reality is, the story of the prodigal son is when the father sees him from a distance, the father runs to him and embraces him and hugs him and throws him a party. And the same is true for you every time. The same is true for me every time. When we return back to the father, that is his posture towards us. But so often we're full of guilt and, and shame whenever we think about how the way that the Lord looks, looks at us. And so Danny Aiken says this, this much I do know, <laughs> so good. He wants you to have the confidence of a child jumping into the arms of a loving father. He doesn't want you to run to a closet or to a cave hiding in shame, okay? So abiding in the Lord can truly give you assurance and confidence for today and hope for tomorrow. That's where we're going. Let's look at the text. First truth is this, abiding in the Lord does not come natural to believers in our broken world. Abiding in the Lord does not come natural to believers in our broken world. So verse 28 says this, and now little children abide in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. Okay, so remember, We've already established the fact that Jesus is coming back. Jesus is going to come back. And so there is going to be a time, whether or not it's here on earth or whether we're in heaven, there's going to be a time where we are face to face with Jesus. And so the question is, is am, I gonna, am I gonna have confidence or am I gonna shrink back in shame? And so remember, what he's talking about here is not a matter of salvation. It's not a matter of salvation. He's talking about the way that the Christian lives. And so whenever we approach the Lord, are we gonna have confidence or are we gonna shrink back in, in shame? And he says the key is abiding. The key is to abide. The word abide means to stay with or to remain with um, or to wait with. So we are to stay with the Lord. We are to wait with the Lord. We are to remain with the Lord. The, the idea of abiding is to spend time with the Lord, to spend time with the Lord in prayer, to spend time with the Lord in worship, to spend time with the Lord in reading your Bible, to spend time with the Lord in repentance, to spend time uh, with the Lord by gathering with other believers throughout the week. To, to abide with the Lord means to be with the Lord. And this is what John is saying is the key to having confidence before, before the Lord. And so, you gotta remember, and this is, this is an important truth, the reason why we can't abide with the Lord, we saw this in the text last week, is because the Lord abides in us through the power of his Holy Spirit. So if we are children of God, we have the Holy Spirit living inside of us. And the reason why we can keep in step with the Lord and keep in step with the Spirit is because the Spirit himself lives inside of us. And so we can abide in the Lord. So if you are a born-again believer, the Lord abides in you in the person of the Holy Spirit. 
okay? So let that comfort you. Let that give you confidence. But don't let that take away from the command to abide with the Lord because that's what this is here. This is, the, the language is an imperative. It is a command. John is saying, abide in the Lord. It's not a suggestion. It's not a, a helpful hint or, uh, or an idea. It is, hey, you need to abide in the Lord. It, it's a command th- this morning. And so I'm gonna make a very broad assumption this morning. And I realize that. And th- this, this is true of me. And I think that this is true for many people here in the room this morning and for many Christians today. The assumption is this, is that we, we can sometimes struggle to abide with the Lord. Sometimes we can struggle to, to spend time with the Lord. There's a reason why John is reminding us of, of this command. And now listen, I, I get it. The reasons, there can be so many reasons why we struggle to spend time with the Lord and why we struggle to abide with the Lord. The reasons could be just straight up busyness. Like my, my calendar is full and uh, I wake up in the morning um, from my alarm clock and I am out, I'm out the door and I go and I do my day and then I get home and it's late and I eat dinner and then I, I just wanna go to bed or I wanna decompress. And the next thing we know, we've, we've gone our entire day without spending any time with the Lord. No abiding, no prayer, no Bible, no worship. We've not talked with any other believers. We've not spent any time with, with the Lord in, in busyness. And I get it. I get it. That, that is a real thing. For some of us, it could, it could simply be laziness. We, we, we don't abide with the Lord just, just because of laziness. It could be exhaustion. It could be anger. It could be shame. It could be guilt. And listen, what I'm not saying is that if you don't abide with the Lord, you don't have a relationship with the Lord. That is not what I'm saying, and that's not what the text is talking about. But what I am saying is that there might possibly be some people in the room this morning who would say, I'm struggling to abide with Jesus. That might be true. There might be some people in the room this morning who who you would find it um, almost non-existent in your life, abiding with the Lord. And there may be people in the room, and this, this is a dangerous place to be, you have no desire to abide with the Lord. No desire to abide with the Lord. And so one of the reasons why I think John is giving us this command is because abiding in the Lord doesn't come natural to us. It doesn't come naturally. Uh, Naturally, I am a selfish person. Naturally, I'm an idolatrous person. Naturally, uh, I want to try to fix things in my own strength and in my own power. I want to rely on things that I can see, that I can touch, that I can do to fix my problems. I, 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 want, I want the things I can see and touch and experience to make me happy and to give me joy. So naturally, I'm selfish and idolatrous and I try to seek security in my own power and in my own strength. That's what comes natural to me instead of abiding with, instead of abiding with the Lord, okay? So this leads to number two. Obedience brings about confidence but disobedience brings about shame. Obe- obedience brings about confidence, but disobedience brings about shame. So you look at verse 28, and now little children abide in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. So the text tells us that the result of failing to abide with the Lord is shame. All right, so if one abides in the Lord, then that means that they're obedient to the Lord's command here. And so that obedience leads to confidence before the Lord. Now, to fail to abide means that you're disobedient, and the result of disobedience is shrinking back in shame. So obedience leads to confidence. Disobedience leads to shame. Pretty simple. It's simple, but the implication from Scripture is huge. 
the implication is, is massive. To shrink back in shame. And shame, unfortunately, is a reality that many of us are familiar with. So many of us walk through this life. This is, this is sad to me. Many of us walk through life with no habits that help us to abide with the Lord. And the result is that we're left to battle with our sin and our flesh, our guilt, our hurts, and our pains by ourselves in our own power and in our own strength. And so John, John is trying to encourage his readers. He's trying, he's trying to encourage us. He says, little children, it's, like, it's in term of endearment. Little children, hear what I'm saying. Hear what I'm saying. Abide with the Lord. Abide with, with Jesus. When you abide, you will have confidence before the Lord. You will remember who you are and whose you are. It, it is, the, the result is a peace that's rooted and grounded in the gospel that can't be found in anything else. It's, it's a comfort that is found from God. It is a rest that you can't find anywhere else when you know who you are and whose you are and you spend time with the Lord and you let the Lord speak to your pain or your shame or your guilt or your sin instead of the world around you or your friends. And so this leads to, to number three. The signpost of a child of God is righteousness. I say a signpost of a child of God is righteousness. Verse 29 says, if you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. So just for clarity, you may not know what a signpost is. Uh, a signpost is like a marker on the side of the road to, like telling you where to go or telling you where something is, right? So a stop sign means stop, yield, you get the point. So a signpost for a child of God is righteousness. And now listen, I get it. You may be thinking to yourself, man, this is such a legalistic sermon. Um, and, and no, the reality is it's not. <laughs> it, it's a realistic sermon. It, it's, it's, it's not a legalistic thing. It's not, it's, this isn't meant to lead to a place of, of being judgmental. But the, a signpost of a Christian is righteousness. Verse 29 says, he is righteous, the Lord. Everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. This doesn't mean that everyone who is good has been, born of, has been born of God and is a child of God. But it means that everyone who has been born again, born again and is a child of God ought to practice righteousness. And so if you want to know whether or not someone is a Christian, you should be able to look at their life and see a pattern of righteousness. That, that, is, that is the reality, okay? And so we need to remember that it is not our righteousness that saves us, okay? This isn't a matter of salvation right here. That comes next, and that comes now. Number four, that to be a child of God is a gift, not something earned. So chapter three, verse one, see what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. And so we are. This is a verse that everyone ought to have memorized. Uh, see here is, in, it's, it's a command as well, just like the word abide is. It's a command. So John is saying, see it. Don't miss this. See what kind of love the Father has for you that you should be called a children, that you should be called children of God that you should be called a child of God. And you are. That's who you are. And so this is a matter of salvation. This is John 3, 16, like the video. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. This is salvation. Salvation is a gift. It's not something that is earned. And so the language here is Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. 
For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Uh, and so to be a child of God, is a, it's a gift. And it's not something that you, that you earn, right? But you see it right here. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. And so this goes back to a signpost of a Christian is righteousness. If you have been born of God, if God has rescued you and redeemed you, then your life ought to be marked by righteousness. That is, that is where John is going. And so finally, look at this. We can have assurance now and hope for tomorrow. We have assurance now and hope for tomorrow. So verse two, chapter three says this, beloved, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. So a few years ago, my family, we went on, we went on vacation. Uh, so like Taylor and I and Elias, Arlo hadn't been born yet. Um, we went on, on a family vacation with my family. And so when we go with my family, we go to Charleston and to the Isle of Palms. When we go to Taylor's family, we go to Hilton Head. It's the best of both worlds. Um, and so we were in Charleston and, um, and we were there with, with my family. So my older brother, Zach, and his family uh, was there. And then Jesse, his wife, Allie, uh, I believe were there. And, uh, and then you have my parents. And so my parents, uh, they had decided that they were gonna go on a date night smart uh, we were at the beach so they went on a date night and so they weren't at home and we had all uh, we had all decided that we were going to go to this restaurant and so everybody was getting ready uh, the guys had gotten ready before uh, the girls and so we were down playing in the living room area waiting on everybody else to get ready so we could leave to go eat dinner and we were we were playing just hanging out and so this was my older brother Zach uh, and then his oldest son Cash and Elias were playing. And so Elias was around two. And so it's kind of fun. It's like a fun stage. He, he is, uh, at, at two, he was like just really kind of being able to like put together coherent thoughts and sentences and be able to like speak them. Uh, but he was also like fearless. Uh, and so he hadn't had too many falls or anything like that. And so uh, he was like climbing on everything and jumping off everything. Uh, and so he was pretty brave. And so we were playing down there. And the next thing I know, Elias is screaming. He's screaming uh, at the top of his lungs. And it's like that scream as a parent that you know it's like not a scream that you can ignore because you know they're fine, but it's a scream of like, oh no, somebody's hurt uh, and this isn't gonna be good. So go over to where Elias is and he's holding his arm and I uh, reach out to try to like touch his arm. When I touch it, he, he screams some more. And so I know that like that, that's bad. Something, something's wrong. Uh, and so I call, we call Taylor's mom. Uh, she works at KOC and it's like, do you have any advice before we take him to the hospital um, to get his arm look, looked at? And she's like, let me call somebody. So she calls one of, the, one of the doctors. And so we're on the phone with her and Elias is with my older brother. Um, and she gives us this test to perform um, before we take him to the hospital, just to make sure that it's not this particular thing that I think I can see a lot of you kind of nodding your head, you know, because you've been there. Uh, and so... Uh, Sharon's giving me these instructions on the phone and I, I, I'm giving them to Zach, my brother. And so he has a lie, straighten his arm out. He has to like make a fist and then they pull his arm up. And when they did it, his arm popped and he like screamed. And then it was like, he was good. Everything was fine. Uh, and the, the look in his eyes at my brother, it was like sheer terror, right? Uh, and, and confusion because Zach had just caused immense pain to his arm, but then now the pain was gone and, uh, and he was fine. And so Elias did something that has just stayed with me that I'll, I'll never forget. He got down off of my brother's lap and he ran and he hid from my brother. And, you know, it's, it's funny, like hearing the story now, but in the, in the moment I was like, oh, this is heartbreaking. Like I've never, I've never seen my child run and hide before because he's actually afraid. And he, and, he, and he was afraid of my brother. And uh, so he, he ran and he hid. And then he was like, he kept poking his head around the corner 
to like see what my brother was doing. Uh, and, and so in that moment, I just had this, like, this, this, this realization um, that sometimes helping hurts, right? And the same is, is, true, is true for us in our walk with the Lord. We, we know that we need to abide, but sometimes our schedules, they get so cloudy and so busy, and then we get caught up in, in life. The next thing we know, we have no habits helping us to abide with the Lord and to walk with the Lord, and then sin can creep in, brokenness can creep in, hurt can creep in, pain can creep in. We feel like we have to hide it or keep it from other people, and we're just not dealing with it very well. There's no, there's no patterns of, of abiding, and, and sometimes... Sometimes helping can hurt and the Lord wants, he wants to help us and the body of Christ sometimes wants to help us and sometimes it can be, it can, it can be scary to have to deal with those things. It can be scary to be confronted. It can be, it can be, it can just lead to shame and to fear and, and to, to guilt and so sometimes helping, helping can can hurt. So I return to this quote from Danny Aiken. It says, this much I do know. He wants you to have confidence. This is, he's saying, God, God wants you to have the confidence of a child jumping into the arms of a loving father. He doesn't want you running to a closet or a cave hiding in shame. And so hear the words I'm saying what I'm not saying. Your abiding does not save you but your abiding can change your life in the here and now. And it can change the way that you view God. It can change the way that you view other Christians. It can change the way that you view the church. It can change the way that you view the world around you. It can change the way that you respond to your hurt. It can change the way that you respond to your sin. It can change the way that you respond to your shame. So go back to the J.C. Ryle quote. I lay it down fully and broadly as God's truth that a, Christ, a true Christian, a converted man, may reach such a comfortable degree of faith in Christ that in general he shall feel entirely confident as to the pardon and safety of his soul, shall seldom be troubled with doubts, seldom be distracted with fears, seldom be distressed by anxious questionings, and in short, though vexed by many an inward conflict with sin, shall look forward to death without trembling and to judgment without dismay. This, I say, is the doctrine of the Bible. This is the confidence that we, that we are going for. So here are the words of John in verse two. Beloved, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. Right? It's, an, it's an already not yet and confident statement all in one. Right, already, you are God's child. If you are in Christ, you are God's child. That is who you are. And what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. Right, and it's, a, it's a not yet. And it's a, and it's a con confidence statement all in one. And so, in your abiding you can have assurance and confidence now and a hope for tomorrow when you see Jesus face to face, All right? So as you respond today, I just wanna give you a few things to think about. Um, the first is how are your affections for the Lord? How are your affections for the Lord? And sometimes that word affection can be funny uh, I think people can hear it and be like, affections, like that's not very manly, uh, but that's dumb. This is important. How are your affections for the Lord? Do you have a desire to spend time with the Lord? Or do you not have a desire to spend time with the Lord? Does your schedule allow you to spend time with the Lord? If it doesn't, you probably should move some things around in your schedule. And I know that might be easier said than done. But how, how are your affections for the Lord? Do you have a desire to abide with the Lord? If you do, good, great. Do it. And I pray that that gives you confidence, 
not a confidence that you can rely on your own power and your own strength to stand before the Lord, but a confidence that's a gift to help you because the world that you live in is broken. That's the confidence that we're talking about. So do it. If not, pray and ask the Lord for a desire to abide, uh, to want to abide with him. Uh, how will you, number four, how would you react uh, when, how will you react when you see Jesus face to face? This is a good question to ask yourself and to be honest about where you are. Uh, if you are looking for something to help you abide with the Lord, we have these things called uh, rhythms journals and they're great. Uh, if you don't have one, you should go buy one. They're out in the resource area. If you have one and it's just been sitting on your desk, uh, you can open it up and use it, and it would be a great tool to help you abide with the Lord. If you have been using it, praise the Lord. I hope that that has been an encouragement to you. Um, and so abide with the Lord. Um, abide with the Lord in your, your scripture, uh, in your uh, rhythms journal. It would be great. Okay? Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much for your word. Um, God, I pray that as we think about these things and as we leave um, this morning and go out into the rest of our day, um, God, I pray that you would just continue to move in our hearts and in our minds and that would, we, we would think about these, these few verses that we spent time in in First John. God, I pray that you would encourage our hearts um, that we can know that if, uh, God, if we are experiencing shame or guilt uh, or fear as a result of sin and brokenness and hurt that's all around us, um, God, I pray that you would help us to see that as your children, as your children, you've um, given us the Holy Spirit to abide in us. And because of that, we can abide with you. And so I pray that you would help us to let scripture speak into our lives and let that be the loudest voice um, in our lives that can help us to deal with those things. God, I pray that by our abiding with you um, that we would have confidence, the confidence to stand before you. Um, God, I pray that you would help us in that. Father, for the, the person in the room who doesn't have a relationship with you, and isn't yet a child of God. God, I pray um, that they would see the truth and beauty of um, the gospel being a gift, and that they would open, uh, that you would open up their eyes, the eyes of their hearts, and that they would respond to the truth and the beauty of the gospel, and that you would rescue them and redeem them, that you would fill them with your Holy Spirit, uh, and that you would begin to produce in them a desire to abide with you, and that that um, would change their life for forever, that that would give them a confidence today uh, and a hope for tomorrow. Father, for all of us, would you continue to give us more of a desire to long for you, to remain with you, to wait with you, to abide with you, to worship you? God, would you fill us with that desire? We love you, praising in Jesus' name. Amen.